visitors and all the regulars. Thank you for coming. Look over on number 356.
Thank you. 
for Len Walker over Calvary Country Church in Chickasha. For Casey. Casey Walker? Casey's Casey. sick. Casey's sick over at the Calvary Church in Chickasha. It's COVID. Uh, she's got COVID. She's 
He has a Bible. Okay. All right. Pray for the Lord. <laughs> They're talking to me up here, and I have artillery ears. <laughs> okay. I said, pray for the rain. Pray for the rain. Okay, there we go. Pray for the rain. Okay. Traditionally, we uh, we have pledged allegiance to the flag as we remember the, what our founding fathers were looking to, to God's word and to God as we founded this nation, and the flag being our symbol of that. So let's let's stand and pledge allegiance. Of I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Pray with me, please. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for this land. We thank you for this nation we have to live in. Lord, we're in chaos right now. see you all out this morning. The Casey Walker that Dave referred to as the pastor's wife at the Cowboy Country Church in Chickasha. She has tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, because of that, her husband is quarantined and with her at the house. And because of that, the church is shut down. So we just pray about the Cowboy Country Church in Chickasha about this thing being undertaken for so they get back together again. I'm glad that this is building up all the time. Uh, and I enjoy our group. This is a great group of musicians. Wednesday night, just seven people showed up to practice for various reasons. That uh, 14 showed up this morning in the office and put it on. And they love the Lord and they really sound like it, don't they? They're just singing into the cross too, very, very well. They get singing and sharing the Lord here. Turn to Revelation, would you please, chapter 1 in Revelation. Uh, several have said to me, uh, I'm so glad they're making it simple, buddy. That's the only way I know to do it, <laughs> make it simple. I'm not that kind of a preacher that goes down deep and stays so long and comes up dry. Uh, I'm not quite in that category yet. I don't want to get there. We want to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus Christ in this book. It was interesting to me. That, uh, yesterday my son called up, who's a pastor in a church up in Keokuk, Iowa, and Jen said, uh, I do that, well good, you know, that kind of stuff. And he said, what are you preaching? I said, Revelation. I said, I'm just in chapter one and two. And he said, I'm just finishing it up. I said, really? So uh, being he's smarter than me, being my son, you know how they get smarter when you're a kid growing up? So he sent me some of his notes. <laughs> Well, I don't know if I came across or not, but I look at him, he's a pretty good thinker. Must be like his mother was or something. I'm not sure about that part of it. But uh, it's been good. I've enjoyed this book. And the key to my heart is this. I don't want you to walk out of here on who the Antichrist is, uh, who the woman is in the scarlet dress on the beast and so forth, what the seven mountains are and so forth. I want you to see Jesus. That's what really counts here. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so I've tried to go through the book, read it again and again, and got my own notes to say, where does Jesus fit in here? And I want you to see that with your heart like a leader. Every Sunday saying, wow, I like this Jesus. He's tremendous. And I'm glad I, I know him and glad that he knows me. So what we're going to do is look at that this morning hour again. Look at chapter 1, would you please? And notice in chapter 1, 
as he is sharing with us, he says in uh, verse 11, I'm the Alpha. That means I'm the beginning. That, that's a Greek alphabet. First letter A, Alpha. And the Omega, like we say Z, or Canadians would say Z, and the Omega, the, the end. I'm the first and the last. What you see right. And what we're going to see this morning hour is John simply writing. And I love this. If you think about these old folks, they like dumb, ignorant, their education. These folks are scholars. We have not evolved into a greater nation. We have devolved to a great group of people that God created your people. I do not believe that Adam and Eve are ignorant people. I think they were great people with great intelligence. We've gone downhill ever since in every phase of life. But write what you see. And I like that part of that. Now what's going to happen here is that Jesus Christ is going to fulfill these next couple of chapters where he said back in Matthew chapter 16. He's talking to Peter and the apostles and they say, what do men, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Well, you're this person and that person. Well, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, well, you're the Christ. You're the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon and Jonah, for flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but my Father is in heaven. And upon this rock, not Peter, not the little rock Petra, but upon this rock, I am the Christ. That's the key here, people. I will build my church. And I like those two thoughts in there. I will build it as mine. It's my church. And I love that fact that I was talking about in that situation here. We are the church. I thank God that Brett got into that this morning in Sunday school we did. Uh, about the church of Jesus Christ. Not the Pentecostal church, not the church of Christ, not a Baptist church. It's his church. The ones that are blood bought, washed in the blood, based on the word of God, loving Jesus Christ. That's the church. What are we? We're a people that are known for a simple little thing. Back yonder, we baptize people. That's one of the things they work with. They call them Baptists. The, the Methodists were gone because the brothers who thought the Methodist church had a method up at four o'clock in the morning. Don't talk to women. Keep your face straight in the pulpit. So they had a method. They taught their boys to preach in that particular way. Pentecostals, we believe in woohoo, having the Holy Spirit, you know, and that kind of stuff in our heart. Now, they had all these things going. That's what they were called. They, they didn't know Jesus Christ. They worked the church. Is that clear to you? I want that to be really known. This is the church of Jesus Christ. And I'm not worried about the one outside that calls itself the church of Jesus Christ. This is the church right here. And any church that preaches the blood of Christ, the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, the express word of God, that's the church. Is that clear to you? So we're talking about this whole thing here in the situation. He, he does it. Look at chapter 2 for just a minute. In chapter 2, verse 9, I like this because it, uh, maybe you can go back to any, any place in place. Chapter 2, verse 9. I know your works. I know your works. And, and Christ does this in chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, all through the thing of the seven churches. I know all about you. And I love that part that Christ is not up in heaven having a banquet someplace, floating around somehow, and we're down here kind of making out ourselves we can in some way. No. He is in charge of this church of his that he founded. Uh, chapter 2 and 3, he says seven times, I know you. I know you. I know you. He is not walking in ignorance of us. One, we can't hide from him. Number two, you shouldn't want to hide from him anyhow. The point was, he, he knows who you are. I love that part about him. And our part is to know him and to make him known. So I want you to see those things in Revelation. And just a little more of the introductory part of this morning hour as we look at communication that he has in the book. So let's bow our heads in prayer, and then let's go to God and see what he's got for us this morning hour. And while we're praying, by the way, I love my pulpit. Man, this is great. I, I didn't think about it when I was home. And these folks leave it alone. <laughs> no autographs on it, no brands on it, no names, just leave my pulpit alone. And when I die, bear it with me. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you for the love of these people, and thank you for the love of God to us. Bless us by your Holy Spirit. Fill us afresh with the Holy Spirit. Teach us by your Holy Spirit. And the one thing we want to do is what the Holy Spirit came to do, to exalt Jesus Christ, to glorify him, as John 16 tells us he came to do. So bless us this morning as we search the word of God to know the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and to walk in his way and in his will. I want you to see three things this morning. First of all, to simply this, 
communication. And that's what this book is really all about. And every, almost the, through the whole book here, he keeps saying, what you see, write in a book. Why don't you write it down? And he has that very clearly to us in chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. You'll find the word, write it down, write it down, write it down. I want you to have it. How do you learn? How do you learn? Three ways. You better learn. Number one, we learn by what we see. And he'll say that. What do you see? Number two, we learn by what we hear. And number three, we learn in kinesthetic ways what we feel or touch. And if you want to really learn the Bible, get a piece of paper someplace, and as you read the Bible, read it out loud. And listen, look at the words very, very carefully, and write things down. And when you close the book up, write down what you saw in that particular writing that day, and you will really learn the book. But just to go to a page someplace, it won't do it. But I guess they use all three of your learning mechanisms to know the Word of God. So I want you to write it down, he says in verse 11 here, and then send it to the seven churches. Remember from last week that the seven churches picture for us what seven things can happen in a church. What seven things happen historically through the history of the church. Seven things that are happening and happen in our personal hearts and lives. What it's all about. It spreads through the centuries. It's picked up the end of churches back in Asia Minor, Turkey at that particular time. And you all have or will have experienced these seven things in your life. Believe it or not, they're going to be there. And here's how to deal with them. That was last week. We talked about that particular thing in your heart and life. Verse 12, chapter 1. I turned to see the voice that spoke of me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And of course, right away, quick, you think, so? And God takes time to explain the seven golden lampstands. Verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. He's talking about Remember what seven means? Complete, fulfill, a perfect church. I want you to see this. It's just one church. It's not seven churches, although there were historically seven actual factual churches there. There's just one church. It's got all these seven factors in that one church. And he's talking about these seven churches, and he calls them lampstands. Why did he do that? Because he's talking about the church that he would create. He said this to us. You are the fill of the blank. Yeah, you are the light of the world. He makes it clear to us that the city set on a hill cannot be hid. If the world is lost and headed for hell, dear people, it is our fault, not the fault of God. I've worked with missionaries for years, and they tell similar stories of nationals, we would call them natives perhaps, and they send these missionaries again and again. Where have you been? Where have you been? We, we knew about this somebody, and we knew that they would come. And even some of them knew it would be a white person, believe it or not. These were a white person. And they knew they would bring a book, a leaf, to them. Where have you been? And the Church of Jesus Christ is the reason that the world does not know. When you look at the scriptures and study it, you'll find that five times. God says this, the whole world has heard. You know in the Bible? Five times. They had no television, they had no jets, they had no big particular steamships of some kind to work over there, they had no phones, but they got it across. Why? Because every person saved, read Acts, read Acts, which everywhere they went, sharing the gospel with people, telling about Jesus Christ. What do we do about it? How long has it been since we have told somebody about Jesus Christ? You see, that's where we have failed your people. We are alive, we've got a cap on the top of it, or it's going to go down someplace. And these lampstands are simply the church shining forth. You are the light of the world. Don't put your light under a bushel, under a bed someplace. Let it shine. Why? To glorify our Father, which is in heaven. Is that simple enough? So God is saying to us here, 
this particular thing. Uh, beside that, in chapter, that's in chapter 5, verse 13 of Matthew. Verse 14 says, you're the salt of the world. I get this all the time. Really, I do. People saying, you, know, you can eat a horse to water, you can't make him drink. Hold on, me. I can eat a horse to water, and I can't make him drink. I just put salt in his mouth first. When he gets the water, he will drink. There's another part that goes with that. You can eat a boy to college, and you can't make him think. That's right. But you can make him think. Make it interesting. Uh, Brett was teaching Sunday school sporting yards for about 23 years as a teacher, and I thought, well, the way you teach this morning sounds good. I'd like to be one of the kids in your class back in that day and age also. Uh, make them think. Make them want to learn. Make them want to think like that. So we are salt. And we are light. We have to light up things for the people in the world. And we're to glorify God just as he did. That's what's trying to get across here. We're a lampstand. And every church, whatever it is, if it's a church of Christ, the real church of Christ, it's a lampstand. To bring forth light into the world. So that's the first thing. I saw seven lampstands. Number two, he also saw this. He saw one light. Look at verse 13. In the midst of the seven lampstands, one light. The Son of Man. Well, that's all he did. Describe Christ. He's in a glorified body. We looked at it three or four weeks ago. There are nine things about him in the first ten verses here. But there are nine things about him. I saw one like the Son of Man, clothed with the garment down to his feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. Wow. Glorified. No dust at the carpenter's shop or the walking along the road. No blood from Calvary's cross. This is Christ in his glory. I saw him. No, a tremendous experience to see him in that way. And I love this phrase here. I saw one like the Son of Man. Sometime, when you feel like counting something, uh, take your Bibles and go through it. Now, I'll give you the first hint. In Matthew alone, the word Son of Man is used 29 times. Look it up in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He loved that name. He loved being like us. I like that. He liked being like us. I love you. He said of Jesus Christ again and again. So wonderful. I saw this man that wanted more than all things else in life to be just like us. In the book of Hebrews, it says, he knows all about temptation. He knows all about heartache. Because being a human being, he was tempted just like we are, and yet without sin. There are only three temptations. There aren't a whole bushel basket full of them. You looked this morning in Sunday school at Adam and Eve, and saw them taking from the tree and, and eating the fruit and so forth from the tree. Something wisely said one time that the, it wasn't the apple on the tree, it was the pear on the ground that caused the problem. And I think that goes on pretty good sometimes. But anyhow, in the Word of God, God made it clear to us that He has us in His position to lift His arm for His glory. And Christ is made like us. Tempted at all points. There are only three sins. First John 2, look it up when you get home. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. That's all. Every sin you commit or could commit is in those three categories. Adam and Eve, lust of the eyes. She saw the tree. Lust of the flesh was good for food and a tree to be desired to make one wise. That's all there. On the amount of temptation, Satan came to Jesus Christ, turned all the world, I'll give this to you because I don't want to worship me, turn the stone into bread, jump off this temple, uh, steeple, no, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, fire of life, take three temptations, and anything you face will be in that category. He was just like us. Just like us. He loved us. Now I come back to keep saying, I know, I know. To all seven churches, he says, I know. Been here, done that, I know. Now I just love the word Jesus Christ because it's factor here in him. Then it tells us four things in here about this one that John saw. Number one, let's go back again and look at the little phrase where it says, I saw seven stars in his hand. The seven stars in verse 20 are the angels of the seven churches. Now we can be facetious this morning, aren't we? Say, look up here, I am an angel. How's that sound? <laughs> but these are the messengers of the church. They were people that were really, in the Greek word here, they are deliverers of a message. 
And that's what the angel is in this particular use of the word here. When the angels are delivering God's word to those people, he has his hand. And I love that part. He keeps me. He holds me. I'm trying to be kept by him by his grace. I thank God for that. Number two, this will make you maybe think a little bit. Out of his mouth went forth a sharp, two-edged sword. That's in chapter 1, verse 16. Go back a little bit here. He had his right hand the seven stars. Out of his mouth was a sharp, two-edged sword. You think, oh, that looks fierce. No, it's not fierce at all. God explains the whole thing himself throughout the whole Bible. This sword thing will be said again in chapter 19 and verse 15. What's the sword? If you study the Bible and put verses together from all over the Bible, you'll discover that the sword is the word. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 12, the word of God is sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the body of sunder, spirit, and soul, and it is the sort of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The sword here is simply the word. So he's not coming here like Tars, no, going through the trees like that with a sword of Christ. But no, he just got the word there. Samuel, the little boy, answered a prayer to his mother. And his mother said to dad, to Eli the priest, I'm going to keep this boy here until he's weaned and ready to go to the tabernacle. What faith that woman had. Eli was a very weak, weak, weak priest. And he had two godless, godless children, sons. They were just immoral. They were, they were greedy. They were self-centered. They were gluttons. And God calls them that. And Hannah takes that little boy, about five years of age, which is about the typical age of weaning back in that day and age, believe it or not, and gave that little boy to Eli to finish raising. One night, a sample's in bed. Here's a voice saying, Samuel? Samuel, he jumps up, runs for Eli, and says, what do you want? Nothing. Well, you called me. No, I did Back to bed. Samuel? And this goes on three times. But Eli got wise. Eli said, next time it happens, answer, here I am, Lord, speak to me. So the voice came, Samuel answered, and God talked. And then he says this, God again began Reveal himself to the people by the word. I'm not looking to have God go woo from some ecstatic thing on the road someplace or in the house someplace. You want to see God? Get in the book. You want to see God? Get to Jesus Christ. He's called the Logos. And this Logos, Jesus said this He that has seen me has seen God. Philip. How can you be so blind for so many years? Because he that sees me sees God. Get to know this book, get to know this person called Jesus Christ, and you'll meet God face to face. You really will. So God is saying this to us here, this sharp twinge sword. And when men are condemned for eternity, they'll be done not by a cause of a man particularly, but because of the word of God. You better be in the book. Hear what it said. It's easy to say, I'm walking in God's will, Scott's word of honor. You better make sure you're in the book. Make sure you're in the book. And it took me years to learn to be a halfway decent husband. I had to get into the book. He was a pastor. It took me years to learn to be a halfway decent father. I had to get into the book. And that's where the answer is all our people in this book. Then I saw in verse 16 that his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And you'll take and go from there. Now, don't do it now, but if you go to chapter 21, verse 23, there's a city that God describes. And the city is almost 1,500 miles cube. 1,500 miles. That way, this way, and this way. And the city has no sun, no moon. Because Jesus Christ is the light of that city. Can you picture that? That's as big as from the East Coast to the Mississippi and Canada to the Gulf. That's how big it is. Plus it goes that far up in the air, 1,500 miles. I cannot begin to believe the 
brightness of Jesus Christ in this day, but his countenance was like the sun, had no need of the sun or the moon or the stars to light it. I can never say I walk in darkness if I truly walk with Jesus. No way to clear. He always makes it clear. Kind of slow sometimes. Not quite on our pace, but you like to have sometimes. They will always make it clear to us. I thank God for that and do that. Number four, look at verse 17. When I saw him, this is what we must see right now. See, this communication, you see what you see, write it down. When I saw him, I felt his feet as dead, and he his right hand on me, saying to me, Don't be afraid. I'm the first and last. But I like that, don't be afraid. If you go through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you'll find the word fear there over 400 times. If you have been a scary cat, you're in good company. A lot of folks are scary cats. If you aren't afraid once in a while, you don't understand the situation. <laughs> because there are things that can make you afraid. Real quick fight. If you keep close to Christ and hold your hand, and it takes that fear away. Don't be afraid. The key to take the fear away is that you're close to him. He can handle it all. He can take care of it for you very, very much. I saw that, John said. And he's communicating that to his people, but that's what's going on in his hearts and lives. For years, I have claimed a particular scripture verse. 2 Timothy 1.7. God has not given us the spirit of fear, of power and of love and of sound mind. If you're in fear this morning, you need to get closer to God and a lot less away from, uh, a lot away from the enemy, from Satan himself. He can give you fear. God won't. And I'm praying to God day by day when the fears come. This has been a hard week through this disease day. Got a phone call from a very very dear physician out of Dayton, Tennessee, that went to our church in Dayton, Tennessee. Dr. Sid Tentahatchai, yeah, that's his name. And here's this doctor in the hospital with the disease. My heart goes out to him. And then I get this call about uh, Casey Walker with the disease. And it's easy to have fear being a creep in our heart and life. And then you be able to just lay yourself with Jesus speak to the Lord. Here I am. Do my best. Walking the right way is all to you now. And surrender to him. And that's what counts in your heart and in your life. So this is what's going on in the, uh, the early chapters about it. That's the communication that God is dealing with. And then he keeps talking. Verse 18. He says again in verse 18, I am he who lives, who is dead, behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of the Hades and the dead. Right. So you've got communication. You've got continuation. Just keep the pin hot. Keep writing. John is writing what he sees about Jesus Christ. Write the things, and here are three things he writes about. God makes it so clear in the Bible. Write what you've seen. That's chapter one. And we're just finishing that up. Write the things that are. That's chapters two and three. The seven churches. Very clearly outlined for us. With a message for us. And then write the things which will take place after this. That's chapter 4 to chapter 22. And that's as simple as you can make it. This is not the book of confusion. This is not the book of hidden things. This is a book called the Revelation. I want you to understand this. So we saw in chapter 1 the nine things in Jesus Christ's life. And things that John was supposed to write about in chapter 1. We will see in chapter 2 and 3 the seven churches. This is what's happening right now. Or is John? Emperor Domitian. Emperor Domitian, the Roman Empire. Head of the church. Head of Jesus Christ. And it's only 90 years old the most. Not too old. Maybe only 60 years old. He hates the church. So John is apprehended for preaching the gospel. Where they're sticking in a stone quarry. Island of Patmos. It was kind of like Scott Mountain over here. Just ran a rock of some kind. And he's like, over there. Pound rock, buddy. And that's where he is. And he's got down the Mediterranean Sea, off the coastline. And he sees these things happening up there. He's a prisoner. For preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
I try to look at this several ways. Number one, uh, what you're seeing, that's a person. Number two, what things there are, and that's a possession. There's all these churches, these seven churches here, that's a possession. And the things that will take place, that's a program that God is in complete control of. All of your tomorrows are in God's hand. God never says, whoops. God never says, oh. No, God's got all in control of your people. It never is God shocked. Never is God out of control. It's all in his hands. So we have the person, the procession, the possession, and then the program. Oh, I thought of another way, too. Chapter 1 unveils his glory. I know you already said that. You kind of hard to believe this person so described by John in chapter 1. Chapters 2 and 3. You know, the seven churches. And dear folk, they're a mess. Even the very first one is a great church. He says, you've left your first law. They've all got kind of, kind of hanging up in the air about them. It's wrong someplace. They're not quite what they all ought to be. So I call the first chapter, the unveiling of his grace, glory. And then chapter two is the unveiling of his grace. He says, I still love you. And every church, he says, I know, I know, I know. Not one thing is hidden from him. And then chapters four to 22, with all this happening, of all these world rulers, he's, is the unveiling of his government. He's still in control. Nothing happens which is out of the control of God in this whole thing. We have the things to see, the things that are, things that will take place. That's the continuation that God has for us in this particular book. We're going to look at that. This morning we discussed, among other things, uh, creation. Uh, that's always fun. Always got a lot of questions with it. Uh, I'm a firm believer in a seven day, 24 hour creation week. And I think I can prove it. When you get to chapter 4 and 5, you see Jesus there as a creator and crucified in those two chapters. We'll look at the days. And God makes it very clear how long each day was. There's no guessing about it. All clear. And God gets to it. This is revelation, not something hidden from us. Well, the third part this morning now is consummation, and the writing is all done. And it does get done, but not for a while. Turn to chapter 10, would you please? In chapter 10 of Revelation, uh, we have thunders that are rolling out. And keep in mind, when I say seven th thunders, which is right in the book here, seven thunders, we kind of roll across the sky, it's not particularly seven thunders, it was that perfect thunder, wow, rolling out. God does all perfection and completion here. Chapter 10, verse 4. When the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write. All about writing in this, uh, this morning hour. I've heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things that are seven thunders uttered. Don't write them down. Don't write them down. Have you ever thought that God might say to you, that's none of your business? <laughs> you know the name Corrington Boom, the hiding place? When Corey Tin Boom was a little girl, she got curious about the facts of life. Like all little boys, little girls do someplace along the line. And so she asked her daddy a question. And the dad kind of gulped <laughs> and said, uh, Corey, go get my case for the morning, would you please? So she would get his suitcase, the chattels with, and so forth, and she couldn't pick it up. So she hollered back and said, Daddy, I can't pick it up. But he said back to her, there are some things you're too young to do. There are some things you're too little to know. Someday we'll make it clear to you, but not today. And God says way back in Deuteronomy chapter 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things shall reveal the one to us and to our children who may profit with all. But there's some things God says right along here to us that's none of your business. So we have in the world a cancer to the cross of Calvary where Christ can turn to heaven with his head because his hands are firm, his feet are firm, and he can say to God, why? Why? And 
God doesn't lie. And we turn our face to heaven and say that God would lie. Why? And he says back to us, it's not for you to know. Right now. This is Jesus. He says, I know you, and I still love you. You can ask the why. I did on the cross to someday to be able to pick it up and bring it back to God. But not today. Not today. And I love this part of Bible in chapter 10, verse 4. That's also true back in the book of Daniel. Daniel goes along with Revelation very much. And I'll do very, very little to tie Daniel, Zechariah, up with this book, as most men on eschatology do. I'm not going to do a whole lot of that. I want to see Jesus. I want to really see. But Daniel gets a vision from God back in chapter 8. He sees it in the morning, and God adds more to him in the evening. I don't know why it's clear that way. But the angel of God says to Daniel, what you saw, what you have seen, get my hand right here, is true. It's true. Therefore, preach it. No, he says, therefore, seal it up. Put it in a book, seal it up. Get the wax on it, seal it up. It's for the future. It refers to many days in the future. But it's not good to know today. Well, some things he didn't understand later on. Because John, Daniel, we told about, um, well, let me tell you, in, in chapter 12, he says, shut up the words, another place, and seal the book. And the second place, he does the same thing to us here. Until the time of the end. Well, I think we're close to that. I think we're really close to the time of the end right now, people. And then he says this, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. I think we're close to the time of the end. We've never had knowledge increased as it has in this past 100 years. Out of all 6,000 years, I think the world has been here on, on this particular earth. We've never had people able to speed. You want to go to the moon? They're selling tickets to it right now. It costs about $100,000. But you can sail, you can sign up and go to the moon. Let me hear, please. I'm not into just walking to the moon. But they actually are so down pat that some are actually making plans to sail, send people up by rocket ship to the moon. I don't want to be on the thing like that. But can you picture that? I saw a cartoon one time. It was frightened real back in that day and age. It shows this old farmer going into the town. And a little sign there says, speed limit 40 miles an hour. And the farmer says, don't know we go that fast, we'll sure try. Get out! Uh, to get into town if you can. Well, that happens sometimes. Well, I can still recall a spirit. I think I told you this about once before. It's in a Dodge car, a brand new Dodge car, little boy, sitting in the back seat of this Dodge car, with both hands clutched in the back, the back to the front seat of the Dodge car. And this guy driving it went 40 and 50 and 60, but a mile a minute. Woo! We were all scared to death. They backed off real quick. <sighs> mile a minute. Hold on. And that's just kid stuff. Now, I don't know if I say that. But God has told us that one of the signs of evil, for the meantime, is too heavy for a pick up, leave it alone, till we're ready. But now I've got to start to show us these things, and I'm really convinced that some of these things happening today are definitely signs of the end time, that Jesus is coming, and you're getting closer and closer and closer. But some things God says here, don't write about that. And then he goes back to writing again, chapter 19. Look at chapter 19, please. Uh, right back there. And I love this very, very much. Because when um, five months ago, Mary and I became husband and wife, it was fun to write to friends of ours and say, y'all come to the marriage. Y'all come. And folk came. We had a good time. And got married. Still like it. And uh, had a good meal and all that kind of stuff along with it. You know, it was kind of nice that way. Nice to get to boss you around again. <laughs> I can go through life or I can carry like that. But anyway, it says, right, and I love this. Blessed are they that are called to the marriage. And God called me. He wants me to come to a place where there's a feast. There's a story in the Bible about that. A man that had a wedding for his son. And he called for the guests to come. And the son said, I can't come. I just lost the land. i got to go look it over. That's a stupid thing. Somebody else said, well, I just bought 10 yoke of box to go try them out. I had never tried a horse out without, I mean, bought a horse without trying it out first. And then the third, the dumbest thing, he said, I just got married, can't come. That's the biggest lie of the month. 
because the Jewish law was, you got married, you did no work. For a whole year, you comforted your wife. And that is something to do for a whole year. Just that. But that's in the book. And God says this very much to us. Blessed are they that are called to the marriage of the Lamb. And if God has touched your heart, because some of you argue and you fuss about predestination, election. Let me tell you something very simple. God wants the word simple. We are told in the Bible of that Satan delivers us in simplicity is in Christ. If you have ever had a tug in your heart to give your life to Jesus Christ, you are one of the call. You've got Satan when they recall you to follow Jesus. If there is ever a tug in your heart to give your life to Jesus Christ, you are one of the call, whatever predestination and election mean. And if this morning you've had that tug at your heart, you never come to Jesus, you ought to do it right now. Because the danger is the longer you put it off, the harder your heart gets, the more dead your ear becomes. Don't put it off. The blessings are those that are called, and more blessings to me are those that say, Woo, I'm coming. I'm hitching up right now, and I'm coming. And get down there for the marriage supper of the Lamb. I like it. Write that down. And then chapter 21, look at 21, please. 21, he says, These words are true and faithful. Everything, chapter 1, to chapter 21 are true. There's no lie here. No deception here. This is a true word of God, and they're faithful. And history has proven that the prophecies of God prove the reality of the truth of God that God gave to us. And these things, too, will come to pass. God made it that way and made it very, very clear. John was to write. We are to breathe and to hear and to obey. It's a pretty good bargain. And then he says here in 22, verse 18 and 19, don't add to it, don't take away. You've already got enough on your plate. You've got enough on your plate. Just take the book here. Don't add to it, don't take away. Read it, listen to it, obey it, and God will change your life. That's what Jesus, who is the word, with the sharp sword of his mouth, wants to your life in my life, because he's the son of man. He loves us and has identified with us just as we are. That's Christ. Now with me in prayer, please. Father, thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And this revelation about him as John has told you, write, 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 don't write, write, write some more. And we keep seeing Jesus. Thank you for his title. It's good that he's Jesus, the Savior. It's good he's Christ, the Messiah. It's good he's God, the Creator. But he's also the Son of Man, just like us. Love that title. Use it again and again because he's just like us and wants that to be true. He loves us. I thank you for that love, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this love of God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. If you leave this place this morning, if you've heard that voice and felt that tug in our heart, give your life to Jesus. Turn from your sin. Repent of your sin. Receive Christ as your Lord and your Savior. May everyone that's heard that obey it call to the very supper of the Lamb. If you're not just obey and reject and use fully illustrations like that, I got land I just bought, cattle I just bought, and a marriage I just had. No, that's not enough, God. They you obey. Those who are called like that are the ones that are elect by you. Take us home safely, but take us home sold out completely to the Lordship, to redemption life of Jesus Christ. Take us on for your glory. I believe these are the latter days. May we be prepared for the trumpet of God to sound, the rapture of the church to take place, for the church age to be ended. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning, and God bless you.